Ata Tita, he had a relationship with the buffalo. He had a deep relationship with them. He was of the Pondere tribe, one of the three tribes, the Pondere, the Salish, and the Kootenai, who lived together on the flatted reservation in western Montana. Back in those days, our people lived totally off the earth. And that's where the buffalo was very important. But things were changing. The buffalo were fast disappearing because they were being killed off. Even by the 1870s, uh, the people knew there was something different. It was taking longer and longer to find the buffalo. Atatitsa realized that we had that cultural imperative to save them from extinction. If they could see this something that they thought would never happen, that the buffalo, the bison would disappear, that had to be devastating. So he took it upon himself to to do what he could. This is a story about an ancient history that, at the same time, is alive right now. As tribal people, there is much that has been taken from us, but there is a lot that we have held on to that makes us who we are. Our relationship with buffalo is one of these things. There are still buffalo on our reservation, the Flathead Reservation, on land that was stolen by the federal government. This is the National Bison Range, and we have been disenfranchised from its management since its beginning. A strange irony because the buffalo on the range wouldn't exist if it wasn't for us and if it wasn't for Ata Tietze. Him and his friends were out there on one of the more successful buffalo hunts. And there was some buffalo that was following along. After three days, they were still at an impasse. So Atatitsa withdrew his request. Oh, 
ואותה חס עיר כל קרעי, ואת אשתר, חיפחום סטס, כל זה לוקח סתם, שזאת הדרך עורך שינתה. אין התקצו, תמפו לתקצו. ופסטקין מסייע עיר כל קרעי, ואין נסייע את השחק קטין. פעם תתחיל, פעם תתחיל סטיחם שווה נס עיר כל קרעי. ‫מצוקה כיוץ הנס, ‫שוב, ותסמוק את שער ושעצחי, ‫תסיצי שקוט וכוי, ‫שוקוי כוי, ‫וצא נסי, ‫וצקוק שיוצא את דעתי. Ata Tita Adesan, Shlata Ti, or in English, Little Falcon Robe. Shlata Ti had the same deep relationship to the buffalo as his father. So years later, while on a buffalo hunt on the east side of the mountains, he decided to realize his father's vision and bring back some calves to the reservation. It's a f- massive feat and undertaking what he did, you know, to... To, to go out of his way to bring the, those bison back. Once you hit the Continental Divide in the eastern front of the Rocky Mountains, it gets very sharp and steep and cold and windy on the east. And to bring anything over that distance, that's a long way and dangerous. There's enemies all around and you have to get these orphans, there's predators out there to get them from the place where they were, back to the Flathead Reservation. It's really, truly amazing. Every living being, everything in the world had a spiritual presence, um, a spiritual significance. We didn't just hunt to hunt or take a life to take a life, it was a sacrifice that that animal was choosing. So it wasn't just, let's just go out and shoot it and eat it. No, you're accepting its sacrifice. So it had a huge spiritual significance in that regard. Is It's more than just a hunt. And that would, you know, carry on to our daily life. They used to hide to make teepees, they used the bones, they used the meat. The role of the bison today, then and today, is still very important. It's still part of us. It's still part of our world as, as Native people. Uh, without them, a part of our world just starts to disappear. The Salish word for buffalo is kwai kwai, which means many blacks a word referring to the days when the buffalo blanketed the land. The Kootenai word for buffalo is kamku kokus iyamu. These words remind us of our long history with the buffalo. For tens of thousands of years, we've lived in this relationship in the natural world that's based on a relationship of reciprocity. If we think about all of the gifts that bison provide for us, not just our material life, but our cultural and ceremonial life. It's incumbent on us to give something of equal or greater value in return. We have a responsibility. We can't turn our back on them. This philosophy of reciprocity was at the heart of Tati's care for his buffalo, and under his stewardship, the orphan calves grew and flourished into a small herd of around a dozen. By then, Shlatati's mother had remarried a man named Samuel Walken Coyote. It 
And so he sold the herd to the Allard and Pablo without the consent of the actual owner, the little fellow. Oh, what a he was heartbroken, really heartbroken. And in a cruel twist, not only did Slatati have his bison taken from him, but in many stories that unfolded outside their oral history, he went uncredited for saving them. Since Samuel Wakan Coyote was Slatati's stepfather, and he was the one who sold the buffalo to Pablo and Allard, he somehow became known as the person who brought the buffalo to the reservation. Michelle Pablo and Charles Allard were friends. What I understand from family history is that Michelle and Allard had the vision that the buffalo needed to be saved. They ranged along the lower Flathead River, and it was like this big wildlife Serengeti. It was a good place for them. Their numbers increased dramatically. The Pablo Allard herd became very important as a source stock and, and were used repeatedly to help restock ranges in other parts of North America, including Yellowstone National Park. As the years passed, Charles Allard died and his widow sold his half of the herd, most of which went to Charles Conrad in Kalispell, Montana. But Michel Pablo continued to grow his half which became the largest free-ranging herd in North America. I don't know what their vision was, how big it could be, however big the reservation could manage um, that many animals, I guess. But with the allotment, that all changed. The reservation here was established by the Treaty of Hellgate. Um, it was negotiated in 1855 and approved by the Senate in 1859. The reservation was fairly successful. There was a loss of, of the buffalo hunt, but they adapted and they were able to still hunt and, and fish in, in the rest of the usual and custom places. But by that time, more and more settlers were moving into this area, more and more demand for land, and so the Allotment Act was created. The government came in and allotted land to all the tribal members for anywhere from 40 to 180 acres or so. And then after all the land was allotted, the government then deemed the rest as surplus and opened the reservation to the settlers. Even though that this land would by treaty was set aside for the exclusive use of the tribe. And so it caused a lot of social strife. It caused economic collapse of what had previously existed. People went from being um, taken care of and, and their lifestyle was okay to total poverty. Um, the fish and wildlife resources were exhausted. All these homesteaders started harvesting all the deer and elk and uh, impacting the grizzly bear, killing them, diverting all the water um, to lands that probably shouldn't have been irrigated to begin with. So it was a total chaos. The whole place was tipped upside down. Up until allotment, there were no fences on the reservation, and Pablo's herd was free-ranging. But after allotment, the Bureau of Indian Affairs knew that fences would start popping up and there would be no room for free-roaming bison anymore. So they informed Pablo that he needed to sell his herd. He was crushed. His vision of that herd and of, of it expanding was all ended. He loved those buffalo more than anything. 
After a major roundup that lasted years, the reservation's herd was gone. Pablo had sold all of his buffalo to the Canadian government after the United States refused to buy them. At the turn of the century, there were people that were calling for the restoration of bison. So they formed a group called the American Bison Society. They contracted with a guy named Morton Elrod, who was uh, the University of Montana wildlife professor, to determine where the best place would be for a national bison range. He loved the Flathead Reservation, so he spent a lot of time on the Flathead Reservation before it was open to homesteading and um, thought it was a virtual paradise. When he saw an opportunity to, I think, bring buffalo back to the Flathead Reservation, he was a little biased because he knew there were buffalo there. He saw that in his career, um, the Allard Pablo herds. It was basically his recommendation to uh, bring it to the Flathead Reservation. It was a natural place to, to have a preserve. It was where many of the bison roamed before they were rounded up. <laughs> And um, it was just taken by Congressional Act. It was a taking. It was just like the homestead. Whether you liked it or not, they were going to do it. And you had to find a way to deal with it. For its original herd, the National Bison Range received 36 buffalo from the Conrad Ranch, the very same animals or their descendants that came from the Pablo Allard herd. These buffalo were joined with four others from elsewhere, Initially, our people were happy that they were returning. The notion of bringing them back and bringing them back to the reservation was seen as very positive until um, they put a fence around it. An old-timer told me of the time he knew of the first refuge manager um, that came to this area. And his first job was to build a fence around the bison range. But he said it was common knowledge. The fence was as much to keep the Indians out as it was to keep the buffalo in. The Indians knew. You don't go on the other side of that fence anymore. That's no longer Indian country. The Salish word for the National Bison Range is in Sohwench, which in English means fenced in place. And once it was fenced in, we were prohibited from working at the bison range. Despite this, the buffalo never left the hearts of the people, a love that resurfaced in 1933 with the birth on the bison range of the white buffalo named Big Medicine. Big Medicine was a white buffalo, the rarest of the rare, and incredibly precious. We did make a special uh, trip to see the the, the big medicine. You could feel the power, you know, and you could feel the power to a lot of us when we go see him, you know. My grandfather was a medicine man. He was also on the tribal council, and he always stated that having big medicine here was important because it centralized uh, a lot of the spiritual power of the buffalo here. Big Medicine lived until 1959, and through his life he was an important touchstone for our spiritual connection to buffalo. And while we were not allowed to manage the bison range, we did everything else in our power to take care of our reservation's land, water, and wildlife. On this project site, what we're trying to do is is twofold. We're trying to restore habitat, and then we're also trying to deal with uh, irrigation runoff. So these these wetlands that you see down below us, we, we have actually constructed over the past 10 years to help clean up that water. Right across the road from us, those, those hills that you see in the background, that's the National Bison Range. 
And the stream that is flowing through our project site is Mission Creek, which flows directly out of the National Bison Range. So we're managing over a thousand acres right next door to the to the National Bison Range. We're we're protecting fisheries habitat. We're protecting wildlife habitat. We're we're doing our best to to restore that habitat. We have very similar uh, goals and, and vision as to the the National Bison Range. What's great about the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes is that they have become a model of how you practice conservation on tribal lands not only within the boundaries of the reservation, but even beyond. And we have over 400,000 acres of land on the Flathead Indian Reservation that is protected for fish, wildlife, or cultural continued use for people here on the reservation. We have restored the trumpeter swan, the northern leopard frog, the peregrine falcon. We've been very active in grizzly bear management and bald eagles and bull trout. We believe we have a responsibility to care for all of the fish and wildlife, all of the water, all of the rivers, all of the plant and animal communities that are on the reservation. Mickey Pablo was chairman in 1994. He is a direct descendant of Michelle Pablo, had a very spiritual, I guess, connection to the bison, management of the bison in the bison range, and felt the area should be restored to tribal management. We agreed. The tribes at the time, you know, exerted the idea of self-governance, a federal principle of self-governance, to be able to manage the bison range on behalf of the federal government. The Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistant Act had been passed, allowing Indian tribes to take those programs formally run by the federal government and run them themselves. And the bison range seemed the likely fit because it was in the middle of a reservation. We had historical, cultural, and geographic ties to it, and we thought that's what Congress meant. We have garnered strong support from local, state, and national conservation groups. But from the onset, there was also opposition, which came from a small but vocal minority, and which continues to this day. This valley is, is a mixture of people, you don't... You've got a lot of good people here, um, but you still have a few people that really resent the Indian people. And their voices are really loud. We have dealt with that kind of opposition, oddly enough, for as long as this reservation's been in existence. I don't know what the underlying reason really is. I try to think, what's the point? Control, I guess. But I really feel like a lot of it comes down to racism. I was raised in central Montana, and I can tell you there was a great deal of misunderstanding in the white world about tribes and about tribal cultures and the interests they had in natural resources. A great deal of misunderstanding. And there were a lot of prejudices and perceptions that were propagated and still persist to today. And I think it's time for us to break that chain. The Wildlife Conservation Society wrote a letter in support of transfer of bison management to the tribe for a lot of reasons because we know they're capable of managing wildlife. They've demonstrated it over and over again. And we felt like this is a chance for the a white world, American Bison Society, which didn't do it that way, to sort of come back to saying, okay, but I think we now need to get them involved. Listen up, listen up. So, my name is Stephanie Gillen and I am a wildlife biologist for the tribe. I'm here today to talk about bison because of their importance to us as tribal people. It's important that we continue to teach our future generations. So, the importance of bison to our culture is not lost. Native people have had a relationship with the buffalo for thousands and thousands of years and they were very prosperous, both the native people and the buffalo. It wasn't under their watch that buffalo became extinct, uh, nearly extinct. Um, so it, native people 
owe their existence on this 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 planet here in in our area because of buffalo and so they uh, have a you know a sincere and deep respect they want to get back it's not about locking anybody out it's not lot about allowing certain people in there it's about sharing it's about understanding it's about keeping that part of the history that part of the the culture that part of the spiritual world that we li- that we believe in uh, keeping it for the next generation if you really look at the story of little falcon robe and you look at what the bison range is today the same mission of what he had is is being honored essentially and um, except the, the one of the major pieces is that we don't have the, the the tribes don't have the role there that we should and so to be able to continue that history and move forward with that management would be very powerful for the tribes and it would be a great way to continue our story and to make sure that we're able to continue caring for the landscape and continue caring for the animals in the way that our elders teach us. So what better caretakers of keeping buffalo on the landscape in perpetuity than the native people that that were here and and watched them evolve and assisted with their um, existence? I would say, let us show you what we can do. Yeah.